you can start, Dr. Abdullahi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we are very happy to to have you here, all of you. And also, I'm going to thank the, Dr. Muhammad, uh, who is um, who's, who's giving more effort about spreading the knowledge and also uh, his experience and also in organizing such events. Thank you so much. Thank you for your effort. And also, uh, I'm going to thank the presence of today's speakers and also uh, for their commitment and their personal uh, professional growth. So we are honored to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, let me introduce you the, our guest is today and this webinar and this refreshing course. And our first guest will be um, Dr. Kiran. Dr. Kiran is a consultant anesthesiologist and uh, pain management in STSFT, NHS UK, and also he's interested in ultrasound guarantees and anesthesia and being interventionist. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for you sharing your knowledge and also in Somalia and also other Somali colleagues. I really giving you a warm greeting. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dr. Kiran. And also the, the other guest will be Dr. Vell. And Dr. Vell is, um, is a consultant and physiologist and also uh, work in uh, Lancashire Teaching, Hosp Hosp Teaching Hospital NHS Trust, Bristol, UK. He did his fellowship in regional anesthesia in Canada. He's, current, he's currently practicing in focus in using ultrasound and networks in regular basis and in teaching in regional anesthesia courses in UK. Thank you, Vell. We are very honored to have you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a brief um, lecture and brief about uh, the practice of regional anesthesia in in our hospital. Uh, as, as we know, um, the, the modernization of medicine also um, gives us um, to talk about more topics about regional anesthesia. Um, next, please. Uh, let me give you a brief example uh, about our hospital before we talk about what we do in uh, regional anesthesia and also network in our hospital. Uh, our hospital was uh, established in 1960. It's a very old hospital. Uh, and also, uh, in that time, there are many um, unfortunate things happening, many wars, many um, our government is destructed, and also... In 2023, in, thousand, in 2003, Somali government and Turkish authorities made an agreement to refurbish and modernize this hospital. And now currently, um, uh, the joining in management in Somalia and Turkish government. Uh, and there is here, uh, there is a res residence education which is going on right now. Uh, next, please. So this is our department of anesthesia and uh, reamination and uh, doctors. As you see, we are six Somali specialists currently working in uh, this setting, and and uh, also other friend and other colleague that um, ca came to us from the Turkey, and uh, also um, Turkish doctors and Turkish colleagues they came here to give and educate Somali um, young doctors. So. Um, these are the our department and these are the doctors who um, take part and also give and uh, the the patient is in anesthesia in our department. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, there are, there are many challenges as we are in uh, as we are in low income countries. We have many challenges in. Uh, Developing safe anesthesia and uh, also safe surgery. Uh, these challenges we share the other low-income countries include that, um, that there is limited number of anesthesiists in the in the country, and also they are inadequate anesthesia staffing is also challenging in low-income countries. 
So uh, there is survey conducted in Somalia that shows that lack of anesthesia workforce in Somalia and most of them anesthesia providers are concentrating in Benadi region, the capital city. Uh, we know that uh, in order to have a good regional anesthesia, there should be a professionals, anesthesia professionals. So in, in cities that far from the capital doesn't have that opportunity to elaborate to and uh, have a uh, safe anesthesia and also to practice regional anesthesia and next for next place and the other these defects of anesthesia infrastructure and equipment and the drugs are the main periods of performing regional anesthesia and for example neck block so and many cities far from the capital doesn't have uh, any more that doesn't have professional is to perform a regional anesthesia, spinal caudal or something like neck block. And, and also that um, that makes that, that there's lack of infrastructure and equipment and drives. So lack of training anesthesiologist and the cost of ultrasound equipment have been cited the major barriers in the, for greater use of ultrasound techniques are the main challenges. These are all these are the challenges of many low income countries and also uh, we share them like this challenge, but in the coming years, uh, we are expecting to move forward and have uh, more trained doctors, more trained professionals who can perform regional anesthesia safely. Next, please. So in our sitting, uh, we perform these types of regional anesthesia, spinal, epidural, also, and caudal, we do this routinely, axial and brachial black block. Also, we do musculocutaneous femoral transfers and top block, bubblitial, adductor canal, interesculine, supra, supra and infotraficular block. And these are the, the routine ones we do in our sitting. Also, um, I hope that um, the other hospitals in the city share this with us. Uh, but the city is far from the capital doesn't have opportunity to have ultrasound and also professionalists who can perform such Amazing techniques. Next, please. So, uh, collaboration between international organizations and universities can help develop educational infrastructure in low income countries and to fill the provide the pipeline and of build capacity. So, this program is also one of the solutions that um, can share knowledge about the uh, um, regional anesthesia and other aspects of regional anesthesia so that we can develop a good anesthesia care and also safe regional anesthesia. Next, please. So thank you for your attention. I really appreciate all of you. This photo I shared with you because it was my first next block I've done in my first year in a resident in Somalia. So thank you so much. I'm really happy for you and I really honor to be with you. Please allow me to welcome Dr. Kevin, consultant anesthesia and pain management in ST, SFT, NHS UK. Dr. Kevin, welcome, please. Hi, Abdullah. Very uh, many thanks for the kind invitation, and uh, also thank uh, Afsra, uh, Mo, uh, and the team for the kind invitation. Um, without much uh, delay, I will move to the uh, topic. Um, this evening, we're going <clears> to <throat> discuss mainly about the physics of ultrasound, mainly the basics, and also how to use it for uh, our benefit, mainly with the scan optimization. I work as a consultant in anesthesia and pain management in uh, the north of England, in Sunderland, uh, sorry, uh, City Hospitals, uh, Sunderland NHS Trust. And uh, I've got nothing to declare apart from my allegiance to uh, spreading ultrasound education through NASGRA and uh, various other uh, invited uh, faculty uh, profile. <clears throat> so when we talk about regional anesthesia, as Abdullah has mentioned, 
there are various worries that we have. And usually it is the worst or dreadful complications, uh, mainly in the form of intraneural or intravascular injections. And the number of attempts sometimes we have to uh, do to uh, get the block in the right time and right place, mainly limited with anatomical variations. And also uh, the main worry is about the quality of block, you know, how long it's going to take to kick in or whether it will work or not, or it can be uh, successful, or sometimes it might uh, lend us with uh, patchiness, which will make things worse. And when we use nerve stimulator, other uh, adjuncts to get the uh, blocks, again, you have got issues with uh, pain, especially in trauma cases, et cetera, where we uh, pain and nerve stimulation, muscle stimulation is not going to be helpful. And then use of uh, local anesthetic volume. Sometimes uh, if there is not a successful block, we might have to use more volumes and that's associated with the local anesthetic associated uh, systemic toxicity, et cetera. So hopefully by the end of this, I'll be able to uh, relieve much of these uh, uh, issues uh, with the possible introduction of uh, using ultrasound in our routine practice. And through this, I'll take you through the mainly the uh, physics and terminology that we use in ultrasound and also uh, the techniques used in ultrasound uh, in regional anesthesia using ultrasound, uh, mainly in the form of uh, optimization. So first we need to understand what is a sound. Sound, as we know, is a form of energy. It's made of vibrations. And as we are all used to using a tuning fork, usually we could hear a lot of vibrations coming through that. And they go in the form of compression and rarefactions. So any object that vibrates, it causes the air particles around it to move. And that leads on to uh, this kind of a waveform. And any waveform to uh, spread through, it needs a medium through which to travel. And usually sound is measured in the form of hertz or oscillations per a second. Then coming to what is ultrasound. The ultrasound is the frequency beyond human uh, hearing ability. So in this picture, you could see our hearing ability is somewhere between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Over 20 kilohertz, it is called ultrasound uh, and usually is emitted by pads, uh, etc. And the one below 20 hertz is rarely he uh, heard by human ear, but we're not going to focus much on that. So the initial interest in ultrasound uh, or the, you know, the hearing frequency or uh, of pads went in close to 1600s where the Italian priest was uh, amazed at how bats would communicate even though they were blinded in a very simple experiment at that time. And uh, he found that there is a, you know, a different way from more like the ultrasound. This didn't come into existence into uh, practice until late 1800s where it was used mainly in navigation in the uh, ship industries and navigation where to locate how deep the anchors are and uh, where to place them. The clinical practice didn't start until uh, after uh, middle of uh, the uh, Second World War or even a bit later. Initially started in Austria where they started using clinical ultrasound mainly as another diagnostic mode to uh, uh, mainly to uh, detect uh, abdominal lumps and things like that. However, this was very primitive and didn't take much precedence apart from uh, coming after a decade or so, more so where it was uh, put into practice by uh, our physicians from Glasgow. Uh, and that time, from then on in 1950s, uh, it became a little bit more uh, prominent. It has been predominantly present in bedside clinical practice, mainly in uh, radiology until 1900s, whereas the initial use of ultrasound in regional anesthesia didn't come into practice until later in 1990s, mainly predominantly used at, uh, to track the nerves and also surrounding structures in uh, Austria. Since then, the practice has not spread that much. It was very initial. However, this has been widely publicized after this practice has been taken up for use in Canada and also uh, many publications coming through the uses of ultrasound as uh, clinical guidelines also been published at that time, mainly to use uh, 
uh, for central venous cannulation, et cetera, to avoid the complications. So that has led into further use of ultrasound as a safer measure for regional anesthesia. And slowly, it has been a, a history since then. In the last two decades, the ultrasound has made significant progress going from uh, uh, you know, um, being used on, only in diagnostic and non-anesthetic setting to uh, even bedside uh, setting and even in emergencies quite significantly by many clinicians, which has been helpful for clinical users. So how is this ultrasound produced? So <clears throat> the ultrasound, as you many of you would have uh, seen, has got, uh, I mean, depending on the size, most of the time, there is a pro or a handheld gadget through which, which is impregnated with uh, piezoelectric uh, crystals. When electricity is passed through these piezoelectric crystals, these crystals undergo expansion and contraction. And that produces the ultrasound pulses, which go beyond our hearing ability. Depending on the uh, type of the probe, as it is called, uh, the pulses can vary. And most of the time, they transmit about 1% of the pulses. And at the same time, they receive back the signal that is coming back to the probe around 95% of the uh, time. As you can see in this picture, uh, you know the, the image uh, shows that as much of it is actually placed uh, inside and uh, these image uh, capabilities are further enhanced by use of the uh, central processing unit or CPU or the computer with this, which is sitting on the uh, in the main machine. So the ultrasound brain the, that you can see in the probe usually comes out as a very tiny slice. Uh, it is less than one millimeter thick, even though the probe might appear about seven to eight millimeters as well. And however, deeper you want to see, uh, however shallow, that can be controlled using the uh, uh, further uh, logistics of the machine. And most of the images that are initially produced were M-mode, etc. whereas nowadays we get uh, 2D and to the extent it has progressed up to 3D, uh, which is quite significantly used in uh, diagnostics and also obstetrics and even 4D is available. The control, uh, the beam, and uh, you know, the uh, user can actually control the beam according to the aim target, how deep or how shallow we want. The sound wave progression varies in various media, and as we know, in our uh, body, we have got different types of uh, tissues, which have got uh, again different uh, uh, impedances through which the wave can uh, progress or, uh, or move across. So in air, it can go very shallow, uh, slow at about 340 uh, meters per second. Whereas in the bone, it can go up to 4,080 meters per second. So this actually can give quite a lot of um, the frequency to uh, go uh, travel across and also come back, which will give a better uh, image resolution. And based on the type of tissues, there are various interactions that happen between the ultrasound that's been processed to go through and the tissues. And these interactions are mainly in the form of attenuation, which normally happens uh, at the level of uh, uh, the, the tissue level, usually when there is a hard target like a bone or absorption, which most of the tissues tend to absorb the uh, ultrasound beam, and some of them reflect it back, and the reflection can be uh, you know, straight back to the probe, or sometimes it can be scattered or refracted. So the amount of beam of wave that has been sent across and the amount of wave that's been received determines how frequent, how well you get the uh, resolution on the screen. And the ultrasound probes, they're of predominantly uh, two different uh, types. So one is a, a linear or a straight probe. The other one is a curved array or curved probe, which you can see. Again, the linear probes come in different uh, sizes, 
depending on again the frequency and the higher the frequency and sometimes it can be very uh, shallow or small probe. So we call this as a footprint of the probe that's again uh, tailored according to the use. And each probe has got a different uh, resolution based on the frequency. On the left of the screen where you see the linear probe, it gives a reasonably narrow field of vision. And you can see it can usually take up to six to eight centimeters, but usually prominently better in the first four to six centimeters at the most. The curved probe gives you a very wild field of vision. So it's usually used for deeper structures or uh, in uh, regional anesthesia practice, mainly for uh, um, uh, abdominal wall blocks uh, from the posterior approaches and spine, uh, et cetera. Occasionally, it can be uh, used as a, a preliminary scanning measure, and then you can change the probe according to how you want to use. Now, coming to the frequency and the resolution, <clears throat> the frequency affects the quality of the ultrasound image. What we mean by that is, as we initially noticed about the frequency being an important factor in terms of the ultrasound, the higher the frequency, the better resolution you get so that means the ultrasound is poorly penetrated. But the lower the frequency, you get less resolution, but there is good penetration. But what we are more focused on is usually having higher resolution and a better picture so that you know, we will be able to appreciate the structures reasonably well. And the low frequency probes uh, are usually used uh, in diagnostics and also in our case, we use mainly for uh, deeper structure visualization. The higher frequency probes are used for superficial structures, including uh, uh, for brachial plexus and also for peripheral nerves, etc. So here is a, 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 a image which you could possibly appreciate. On the left, it's the high frequency probe on the 12 megahertz uh, probe where you see the uh, interscaline uh, brachial plexus marked in the yellow between the anterior and middle scalene muscle. I hope you can appreciate compared to the, uh, the right-sided low frequency image, the left-sided image has got a better resolution and better appreciation. Why, it is, why is it more important? It's important to have a better resolution and um, better image so that we can uh, direct the target or the needle accordingly. At the same time, appreciate the surrounding anatomical malformations and also look at the local anesthetic thread, etc. Now, coming to the uh, probe, as I have previously depicted, the ultrasound beam is emitted in the middle of the probe, which is about less than a millimeter. And when the needle is parallel to the ultrasound beam, as you can see on the right side top, you will be able to see the entirety of the needle. And in the below, you can see that you can still see the needle. However, when the needle is passing through the beam, you will probably notice that, but it will not show the entirety. So this is very important to appreciate when you are initially scanning with the needle and you'll start to see that uh, we can see the needle, but not the tip. So it's always important to follow the needle through from the trip all the way to the length of it, uh, which I'll come to in a short while. We have got, depending on the type of the machine, uh, various other capabilities that are possible. One is color Doppler. Color Doppler, again, uses uh, uh, gives you an indication of the blood flow and the surrounding vascular structures. And that is very important, as we know, anatomically, most of the nerves follow the path of the vessels and you invariably will have reasonable amount of vessels surrounding them. Sometimes we can also use color power Doppler, which is more sensitive than the color Doppler in detection of the flow, but it doesn't indicate the direction. Like, as you can see in the uh, previous one, when it is blue, the uh, flow is going away. When it's red, the flow is coming towards the probe. 
Whereas in color, color power Doppler, you tend to see reasonably in, uh, an orangish uh, image, which shows uh, about um, the uh, presence of a, a blood flow or a vessel. So this is about the reasonably uh, normal anatomy. Sometimes we also get uh, uh, different kind of images, what we call them as artifacts. It's important to know the artifacts because these are the false images within the actual anatomy, which sometimes can uh, uh, mis misguide us. There are many of these, including uh, many causes for uh, these, including improper uh, system operation. That is, as, as a user, we should understand our machines well and how they work, and also using proper transducers and proper placement of them. Occasionally, the anatomy can also be deceiving, and uh, that can lead on to further uh, uh, development of further art artifacts. So the first one I show here is an air artifact, as you can see on the uh, arrows on the left side, where the transducer is not in touch uh, with the um, uh, skin or the surface. Uh, because of lack of conductive gel. Because it's very important to have a transmitting medium between the probe and the surface, like the conductive gel that we commonly use. And if that is not in significant contact, then you get a, an air artifact like this one. Then we have shadow artifacts, where we see the hypoechoic region, uh, like a bone shadow. Uh, deep to a uh, hyperechoic uh, bone shadow. So if I were to show the left sided image where you see the uh, arrow marked one the bone shadow, which is hyperechoic, just below that one, because the ultrasound is not able to penetrate and go through the bone, you tend to see a hypoechoic, which is the dark uh, area below it. And that can be one of the artifacts on the right image where we commonly use a curvilinear probe to look for the uh, as, uh, spinal anatomy, which is depicted here. As you can see in the middle, where you see the spinous process, below the spinous process, the whole of it becomes dark. It doesn't mean that there is nothing below in the darkness. It just means that you have to be aware that the ultrasound hasn't passed through. So there are, might be still other things that might be hidden around it. So you might have to use different measures to optimize that image. Then you get the enhancement artifacts, which is what we sometimes call as a post-cystic enhancement. And as you can see in the left image, behind the artery, which is shown as a hypoechoic or a dark circle. Behind that, you get an enhancement artifact, more like a hyperechoic image. It should not be mistaken for the presence of a, a nerve or any other structure. And using dynamic scanning and using certain uh, mesh maneuvers through the probe, will actually give a better picture of what is happening. And we have to be aware of that, especially when passing the needles. On the right, it shows very similar, uh, where you see a post-cystic enhancement following, uh, just hidden behind uh, the cystic uh, swelling. So coming to the uh, quality of image improvement, it depends on the resolving capability of the system whether it is the axial or lateral rotation or contrast or temporal rotation. Then it also is much important for the processing power or the ability to capture, preserve, and display the information, which are the characteristics of advanced machines. So that is where the, uh, the industry actually uh, rate the machines accordingly. To give you a better image, they charge you more for using with the use of all these technologies. So coming to the ultrasound image uh, of various uh, structures or that we normally tend to come across. So if we look at the veins, they usually appear anechoic, anechoic and uh, reasonably compressible. Arteries um, appear very similar to the veins, but they are usually pulsatile and less compressible. Fat appears hypoechoic with irregular hyperechoic lines. So you'll see more like a, a, a fish scale pattern. 
In the muscles, again, it can be heterogeneous depending on the content of the muscle, uh, where there can be, again, mixture of hyperechoic uh, within a hypoechoic tissue background. You will see them sometimes fascias going in between, which might also make it a little bit more confusing. But dynamic scanning, either uh, you know um, through the uh, cephalad or caudal direction or to the side to side can uh, give you a better picture of what is happening. Tendons, predominantly upper hyperechoic because of uh, a technical artifact and also they have got reflective tissues similar to the bones. And bones are most of the time hyperechoic or uh, more than any other tissue that you see uh, combined with a hypoechoic shadow usually hidden underneath. Nerves, which are our targets, are usually hyperechoic in certain areas and hypoechoic. The character of them is depending on various uh, anatomical structures, which I'll show you in a second. <clears throat> As you can see in this one, where we have tried to uh, show you a picture of the uh, subcutaneous tissue along with the skin, uh, which are on the top, followed by the uh, muscle interface and the uh, muscle fibers that you see, which go between uh, the lines. And the bottom, you can see the hyperechoic bone with hypoechoic shadow underneath. And the fat, as you can see, it usually like a fish, fish scales on the uh, top, interspersed with hyper and hypoechoic shadows. The appearance of nerves, uh, as you can see, sometimes it can be more like a honeycomb, uh, surrounded by good uh, epineural tissue. And uh, as you can see around here, and then sometimes uh, more in the uh, proximal nerves uh, where they're filled with a uh, reasonable amount of connective tissue and also uh, um, adipose tissue. You can see them reasonably hyperechoic on the periphery, but hypoechoic completely uh, inside. And this is a picture of interscaling uh, muscle. And if you look at the anatomy of uh, the nerves and their structures and uh, our neural structures, uh, at various levels, you will start to appreciate why certain nerves appear hypo and hyperechoic. Especially in the proximal nerves, they have got a reasonable amount of uh, 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 spindles of nerve fibers surrounded by uh, perineural tissue and also uh, uh, the connective tissue and the thickness of the perineurium is also high. Uh, and the hypoechoic brachial plexus, this is mainly in the interscalar group. And as we go to the uh, periphery, uh, we get less of the connective tissue surrounding them and also perineural tissue. And hence, uh, some of them, they appear hyperechoic, especially the uh, musculocutaneous nerve, as you can see, it's surrounded by a reasonable amount of uh, adipose tissue, so it appears hyperechoic. So, <clears throat> Based on what we have discussed about the basics of uh, ultrasound, the summary of, uh, summary of this ultrasound technology, the image quality predominantly depends on the uh, probe technology and the computer processor. So unfortunately, we are depending on the uh, type of machine we have. The high frequency probes are commonly used for superficial structures and the lower uh, low frequency probes for the deeper structures. You must find the right balance for image optimization and sometimes chasing uh, for a better image by not being able to produce, uh, 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 by not being able to do what you need to do is not going to be uh, optimal as well. So understanding our anatomy and using it in the right way is also helpful here. And you have to understand that nerves sometimes appear hyper or hypoechoic depending on location and the surrounding tissue. Much of it, you can, I've also given you a reference article to look at to, to understand the uh, ultrasound uh, physics. And you can also use the QR code if you like to get into the article and it's a PDF article and it's uh, free to download. So coming into ultrasound techniques use, used in uh, regional anesthesia or the second half of this uh, topic, there are Various, time, various times we come across people use uh, some of the terminology uh, reasonably lucidly, but uh, uh, re uh, recently we have uh, had a lot of uh, consensus on this in terms of uh, uh, making it more uh, uniform across all the practitioners. So I've shared the slides later as well, but if you can look at uh, some of these, 
the common ones that we use is using the probe to slide either from side to side or top to the bottom, and also using one side of probe with more pressure, where we call it as heel toe. And the tilt and rotations are commonly used once we have got a reasonable amount of anatomy uh, or um, at the image that we want, when the needle is not uh, in the right direction or needle is not able to follow the anatomy that you want to target at, then we may have to use the tilt and rotation reasonable amount of uh, levels to get your image uh, to a better value. <clears throat> so when we do the ultrasound guided blocks, it predominantly involves three steps. First, choosing one of the two imaging views, whether you want the long axis or the short axis. Next, scanning in the, along the nerve track for image optimization. So whichever is your target, you don't look for one and you always look a bit more proximal, a bit more distal, and also to the sides to look for the optimal level where you could safely negotiate your needle and get there. And also choosing the needle approach, there are two ways. One is in-plane approach and out-of-plane approach, which I'll go through in the next few slides. So the long and short axis is fairly simple. When the probe is perpendicular to the uh, target, it's predominantly a short axis. And the probe being placed uh, parallel to the uh, target or the, either the nerve or the arteries, then it will be the longer axis as shown here. And <clears throat> while doing the scanning, there are a few things which we need to focus on. Depending on the target and also the appreciation of surrounding anatomy, the part maneuver where we use pressure, appropriate pressure to locate or to alienate the target. And usually, as you know, veins are compressible even under minimal pressure. So application of more pressure can actually compress them and might uh, lead on to uh, other complications like uh, puncturing the vein or possibly sometimes you might need to pressure, apply a reasonable amount of pressure to locate whether you are in the periarterial area. Then alignment, the sliding movement of the transducer along the course of the nerve, usually in the lengthwise, where we use, which we use in the short axis view, which I'll show in a second. And the rotation, either it is clockwise or anti-clockwise, uh, transducer movements, uh, you know, especially it's important in the long axis view when you're looking to track the needle as well. Tilting, it's a movement of the transducer to optimize the angle of incidence where you don't rotate the probe, but it's a slightly tilted as, a, as I've showed in the previous image to aim the ultrasound beam to traverse through either the needle or the target that you are aiming. Uh, the simple um, a diagram showing how these are technically used for the path maneuver and also using the uh, dynamic scanning, scanning up and down to look. And then coming to the needle, which is going to be our next target, because ideally our target is to go there uh, with the needle, we have in-plane and out-of-plane techniques. In in-plane technique, the needle is inserted within the plane of the imaging to visualize the entire shaft and tip. As I showed in the previous image, you have to appreciate that the needle ultrasound beam is only in the middle of the beam, uh, in the probe, up to one millimeter uh, um, diameter. So you need to have the needle in the exact plane. When you talk about out of plane technique, the needle is inserted. So the beam is crossing the plane. Uh, of the needle. So you will see the uh, the needle uh, in very nearer to the target, but at the same time, you can move it uh, very closer so that you can approach it. So as you can see in here, uh, where we're using uh, in-plane uh, technique for the axillary block, uh, usually you'll be able to track the needle tip uh, all the way along, as you can see. Theoretically, it is more safer. However, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to perform, especially not every area that we access has got a reasonable amount of anatomical approach. And sometimes, as I've showed before, it falsely, it gives you false security 
that you are in plane when the needle tip is actually uh, out of uh, plane or not in your view. And because of the longevity or the length of the needle that has to travel the target, if you can look from here, uh, as I can say, from uh, the top to here, it's about a centimeter. Uh, if it is out of plane technique, you can uh, you, your length of um, needle that the tra uh, needle travels to the target is far minimal. Whereas here it has traveled more than three to four centimeters, so that can be a little bit more painful for longer uh, insertion planes. Out of plane, as you can see, it's mainly the middle, and the needle traverses into the beam, and then slowly we move. Uh, use the move across technique. Uh, so here the advantage is the needle path is shorter and less patient discomfort. But the main disadvantage is it can be uh, a bit tricky for accurately tracking the needle tip and sometimes difficulty in uh, finding the echogenic dot as the needle crosses the ultrasound beam could be an issue. So um, I wouldn't normally suggest for beginners, try and aim for in-plane technique as much as possible. But in certain areas, out of plane might be the way uh, forward, especially in the ankle blocks, et cetera. The next one to use are possibly use of echogenic needles, where you can see the needle uh, in, the, in the distal uh, one, to two uh, 22, one to two centimeters is usually given a, an etched appearance, which will reflect the beam reasonably well so that you get the security that the needle path and the needle tip is reasonably visualized. So these are the other uh, needle uh, measures that you can actually use to improve your uh, block success rate. So for any image acquisition or optimization, first we need to be very thorough with our anatomy. We know, need to know the anatomy where we need to go and pick your acoustic window accordingly, whether it is linear or curvilinear. Choose the appropriate transducer accordingly as well. And locate the nerve and the surrounding structures. Handle the transducer using the path maneuver. Uh, maximize your ultrasound machine capability. Use the machine. Sometimes you might have to use uh, the gain accordingly, the way how, how you need the target. And use of echogenic needles can actually be uh, very helpful, uh, especially when you're uh, starting new, so that you can keep the beam and the target all the way through. So when using the needle, always approach a shallow angle until you see the needle coming in the ultrasound beam area. Otherwise, there can be, if you, what I mean is, if you use a reasonably angled uh, approach, then your target, you, the needle might cross the target even before you can see it in the beam. So always use a very shallow approach until you, the needle is just under the probe so that you can guide it and then you can change the angle accordingly. Also use the rotation and tilt on the transducer as necessary to get the needle to view. Just around the time of injection, you can always use a little bit of hydrolocation or hydro dissection technique so that you can see the tip and to be sure where your tip is or to follow the uh, needle to the tip. Sometimes it's usually used for a radial nerve in the axillary block as well to locate where we need to go and then target it accordingly. So I hope with this, I have uh, <clears throat> given you enough information. Uh, and also convinced you enough to use ultrasound in your regional anesthesia techniques, as it's usually safe to use ultrasound in them. And it's also compact and portable in most uh, areas. It is available to that extent. And there is real-time visualization, visualization of both the anatomy and also your needle track. I hope it is going to be very useful in terms of increasing the safety, especially by avoiding of any intraneural or intravascular injections, which are which can be lethal. And also reduces the number of attempts so that we don't need to go around and reduces the uh, complications from them as well, especially around the uh, lung, et cetera, pneumothorax or hemothorax, et cetera. And also reduces the pain due to muscle contraction, especially use of nerve stimulator. And at the end, it improves the quality of our blog and also the onset time and success rate, which are our primary targets. And I thank you, uh, everyone, including uh, Astra and also uh, the um, uh, Abdullah, 
uh, for the opportunity and wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Uh, thank you so much. An amazing point, really. I enjoyed it. I think uh, I, will do, I will listen to this lecture again and again in the YouTube. So uh, thank you so much. And we are honored to have you. Uh, our next guest will be Dr. Vell. Dr. Vell is a consultant anesthesiologist and also working in Denshire Teaching Hospital and Just Trust. And he did his fellowship regional anesthesia in Canada. And also his currently peace practice involves in ultrasound for nephrolog and on a regular basis and teaching in regional anesthesia course in the UK. Thank you, Vel. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, can, you can you see my screen? Of course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, uh, Mo for inviting me to do this. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, webinar session. Uh, and thank you to you, uh, Dr. Abdullahi, for uh, letting us present it. And thanks to Kiran as well, because I've known Mo and Kiran for a long time, and uh, they run fantastic courses in the UK, which I've been part of teaching. So my topic today is to talk about regional anesthesia for hip fractures. Uh, it's quite an Im Im important topic in terms of pro providing pain relief, and uh, we'll get to know why in the further few slides. So disclaimer, I have uh, nothing financially to disclose. Uh, most of the images I've used in this presentation are from publicly sourceable internet resources. Uh, and some of the pictures I've used are from this app called uh, Anesthesia Sauna Anatomy, which is available both in uh, Apple Store and Google Play. It's a subscription-based app. So this is where I work, um, Royal Preston Hospital. It's part of Lancashire Teaching Hospital in the northwest of England. Um, so we're a fairly major teaching hospital and a major trauma center. So this uh, is our helipad landing site, and this is our accident and emergency department. Um, we tend to see lots of trauma, uh, and we're not very far from um, Lake District, where potentially uh, you can have uh, get much trauma. So we're fairly busy, so we do tend to see uh, lots of hip fractures and other fractures. So hopefully... Um, uh, you can relate to the presentation in one form or another. So why hip fractures? Why does everyone go about talking about hip fractures as to um, what the problem is? Why are we focusing on it? Because of the morbidity of it, really. So an average age of hip fracture in the UK, at least, is around 83 years. Uh, anybody over 65 um, is found to be uh, more prone for hip fractures because of osteoporosis and other, other stuff. Not necessarily that um, it is a disease um, with high morbidity, so it occupies a um, lot of hospital beds. Uh, the NHS currently has about 140,000 beds, far less than what it used to have. So hip fracture patients at any point in time um, occupy about 4,000 beds in, in the whole of the NHS, which is roughly about 3%, which is a substantial number if you think about it. And the cost for hip fracture, fracture management in total uh, amounts to... 1.5 billion pounds a year, huge number. This is not just the operation and um, other bits. This is a whole stay from being admitted to operating post-op stay discharge, everything included, still a substantial amount. So um, if we can get these people treated in a um, efficient manner and get them discharged out of hospital, we would save beds and money. Hence, there is lots of focus on hip fractures. And the morbidity and mortality with hip fractures is high anyway, like I said, because of the age of onset is uh, fairly high. They've all got comorbidities of one sort or another. And quite often, a hip fracture ends up being sort of a terminal event for most of them, especially when it's not treated effectively. Uh, and the least we can do is provide them adequate analgesia. So based on all this, the government looked at this and um, there was a nice guideline which... Um, um, Kiran alluded to, a uh, National Institute of uh, um, Clinical Ex Excellence, which 
basically provided a framework for everybody to follow. So every any citizen surgeon um, uh, would be aware of this guideline and follow this guideline to help with hip fracture management. And it has been updated over the period of time, and the latest update has been in 2023 regarding the surgical part of it. So based on this, the anesthesia team um, did a national audit um, called Anesthesia Sprint Audit Project to look at uh, how the anesthesia and analgesia were performed in hip fracture patients. And at that time in 2014, um, only 56% had nerve blocks as part of their analgesia, which is, though not bad, but still could be improved quite a bit. Since then, it has got better um, because of the, all the guidelines and all the um, um, sort of protocols and media around hip fractures. So it is a um, disease with significant morbidity that um, has implications in terms of um, clinical impact and economic impact. So in the UK, we are fortunate to have this hip fracture data, database, um, which is quite unique because not every orthopedic disease has got a database, but hip fracture, because of the morbidity, um, this database includes um, uh, information about a patient's uh, admission to hospital, um, when the surgery was performed, what sort of anesthetic was performed, um, have they had nerve blocks, how long did they stay, and what the morbidity and mortality are. So quite an extensive database, a lot of money and time has been put into it. And um, the audit program underneath, Falls and Fragility Fracture Audit Program, uh, encompasses a fair amount of data in terms of ortho, geriatrics and stuff. This is all packaged in what's called a best practice tariff. So if a patient comes through the hip fracture, if it's treated in a timely manner, the hospital gets a better tariff for it. So there is an economic incentive apart from the clinical incentive. So um, this is quite a useful information for us to have. And anybody can log into it. So you can log in from Somalia onto the National Hip Fracture Database and just look at any hospital in the UK that inputs data into it. And it will give you some idea as to what... Uh, key performance indicators are, what clinical factors are, and various charts. I've got a couple of slides in the end to show you, um, which will give you some information as to what you can look at. Uh, quite useful information to have if you want to get some idea as to uh, what what information and everything you can gather from uh, a database. So, like I said, um, because there's been so much focus, um, both the anesthetic and surgical side uh, and NICE have come up with lots of guidelines um, anesthesia, uh, our association of anesthetists in the UK, came up with a guideline for hip fracture management, um, which emphasizes pretty much what um, NICE said. Um, the main ones, NICE recommendations are analgesia wise, um, as soon as the patient's admitted, um, provide paracetamol every six hours preoperatively and into the post operative period. That's the minimum, unless it's contraindicated. And then they go on to say uh, offer additional opioids. Um, if paracetamol alone does not provide sufficient preoperative pain relief. And as you would su suspect, paracetamol alone doesn't really provide much because you need something stronger for a fracture, which is plain and simple. And what is that stronger thing it can provide, apart from opioids, um, is nerve blocks. And these days, it should be fairly standard because at least in the UK, uh, the accessibility to kit um, and drugs is fairly... Um, easy to get and uh, there shouldn't be any reason why nerve blocks aren't being provided and increasingly um, that message has got across and the percentage of people doing nerve blocks preoperatively usually in the emergency department is quite high and the emphasis is to minimize opioids because as i said these people are got plenty of comorbidities you don't want to be pumping them with opioids potentially with causing lots of side effects and the other interesting recommendation with nice is they recommend to avoid non steroidals um, if possible. Again, because of these old people having loads of comorbidities and potentially uh, non steroidals can affect their renal function and cause more problems. So, hence, nerve blocks play a significant role, important role in providing pain relief. So, moving on to the actual um, topic. Um, so, why is um, hip joint painful? Because the innovation is quite complex. Uh, it is not one or two nerves. It's a multitude of nerves. The majority of them, which we know about, are femoral, obturator, and sciatic. But there are plenty others which aren't necessarily highlighted all the time. Uh, we'll see them through in the other slide. Hence, um, it's difficult to manage a hip surgery 
um, under just a nerve block alone because of the complexity of nerves. So ideally, you want a, a central neuraxial blockade like a spinal or an epidural or, of course, a general anesthetic. So just to do a hip procedure under a nerve block alone is quite tricky um, So because of the complex innovation. And the innovation doesn't necessarily stop with the periosteum because the hip capsule, the hip cartilage, and the ligaments are all innovated and they're quite sensitive. And there is two types of um, receptors in there, the nociceptors, which are the pain receptors, which cause the pain, and then the mechanoreceptors, which are to do with the movement. So obviously, um, it be, it, with it being lower limb, uh, you need to have uh, mechanoreceptors um, to um, get proprioception and help with your movement. So because of the complexity, uh, it is quite difficult to uh, numb the hip in total just with a nerve block. But we can put nerve blocks in to provide adequate analgesia, which is the aim of this topic. So to look at various um, innovation parts, this picture on the left, first picture, um, one on the left here shows the anterior part of the hip. Um, so anterior part is predominantly supplied by three nerves, obturator nerve, femoral nerve, and accessory obturator nerve. So there is some overlap between um, these three nerves supplying the front part of the hip. Um, the superior medial part and sort of um, uh, inferior me inferior lateral superior lateral and inferior lateral rather sorry supply the femoral nerve superior medial is obturator and inferior medial is accessory if you come to the back of the hip um, there are different nerves first one the sciatic nerve and then the superior gluteal nerve which have an overlap area and then the inferior part of the hip is supplied by nerve to quadratus femoris, which doesn't get talked about very often. Um, it is, it's not part of the sciatic nerve. It comes from the sacral plexus, but it sub supplies a substantial part of the hip, posterior part of the hip. So, uh, and you can't really block it separately um, outside. It has to be a spinal. And the other nerve that can supply is inferior gluteal nerve. So there's four nerves at the back predominantly and three nerves at the front. So altogether, seven nerves at least to... Um, innovate the hip joint, the capsule and the articular branches. So you can see how complex it is. Um, this picture here on the right um, expands it a bit more in terms of where the pain comes from. So the, we have a schematic diagram of the nerves. Um, the front of the hip here, this yellow bit here is the femoral nerve. This orange bit here is the obturator nerve. And then the smaller light orange is the accessory obturator nerve. So those are the three nerves we mentioned here. So if you look at the middle part here, uh, where the green and red color is, the red bit is the nociceptor bit, the pain sensation bit. So in the front of the hip, right in the middle, is where most of the pain comes from, sort of superior lateral, I would have said. So, and that's contributed by all three nerves. So this is where most of the nociceptors are concentrated on. If you come to the back of the hip, uh, the different nerves we discussed are the sciatic nerve with this one, and then the nerve to quadratus femoris is this one, and the red is superior gluteal nerve, and then the other one is inferior gluteal nerve. So these three, four nerves. But what's interesting, if you look at the back, is there isn't a great deal of red bit. In other words, there isn't a great deal of nociceptors in the back of the hip capsule. Um, predominantly green. The green is mechanoreceptors, which are the ones that help with proprioception and movement. So most of the pain from a hip fracture comes from the front. So if you can numb the front part of the hip, we can provide a reliable analgesia for a hip fracture. There is some a tiny tinge of red bit here, but that's not a great deal. Majority is in the front. So front of the hip is where most of the pain comes from. So that is the capsule part. Moving on, the other source of hip pain is from the acetabulum. Acetabulum is also supplied with uh, plenty of nociceptors and mechanoreceptors. So here, um, the on, if you look at the picture on the right, so the acetabulum, this is the um, acetabular cartilage, the labrum. So superior acetabulum is where most of the pain is. So if you look at the red bit, it's concentrated here and the anterior part and posterior part. So most of the top part of the acetabulum, superior acetabulum is painful. If you look at the inferior part, it's green. So most of the proprioception comes from the inferior part and some in the superior part. But predominant pain is from the superior rim of the acetabulum. So if we can numb that bit, then um, 
it's obviously uh, much more uh, better for analgesia, but, but you can only numb that by doing a spinal. So that's the other part. So all of this red bit is nociceptors, all of the green bit is mechanoreceptors. So two main components of hip pain are the capsule and the acetabulum. But in a hip fracture, you don't necessarily have a problem with acetabulum because the pain is because of fracture of the neck. But this is for hip arthroplasties, just to um, give you an idea where hip pain is from. Um, so this picture just em em emphasizes the same thing. It's just it's in black and white. So the top row is um, capsules and nerve supply for the um, uh, hip. Bottom row is capsule supply for the back of the hip. So to reinstate, front of the hip is femoral obturator, accessory obturator. Back of the hip is nerve to quadratus femoris, superior gluteal nerve, and inferior and sciatic nerve. So those are the nerves um, we need to be thinking about in terms of providing pain relief. So what blocks can we do? We, we said uh, you can't numb it all just with blocks, but at least we can do something to give analgesia. So what blocks can we do? Uh, femoral no nerve block is the main one because we've, we've said front of the uh, hip is supplied by the uh, femoral nerve. Uh, common nerve block to be done um, in the UK, uh, at least in the regional anesthesia circles, um, we have a classification of what's called plan A blocks, uh, which are the blocks everybody is supposed to be able to do or at least learn to do so it's like a basic nerve block um and speaking to um listening to dr abdullahi's talk earlier he said that femoral nerve blocks are practiced in somalia which is good to know because obviously it's quite an important block in, when it comes to hip fractures uh next one is the fascia iliaca block um which again sort of tries to encompass femoral nerve predominantly also with the um, obturator and potentially lateral femoral cutaneous, but predominantly, again, femoral nerve and opt, um, uh, lateral femoral cutaneous. So with the fascia aliaca, we have two approaches, a supra-inguinal approach and a infra-inguinal approach. Um, sorry about the spelling mistake. It should read uh, infra here. So supra and infra-inguinal approaches. So we'll see that in the next few slides. Next one, uh, this is a latest kit on the block uh, called a PANG block, which stands for pericapsular nerve group. Uh, this predominantly um, works for the front of the hip. And then lumbar plexus block, which is something we can do. It's been in um, practice for a long time. Uh, it has its limitations, but uh, it can be done. And then the other nerves, um, which uh, can be blocked, are obturator nerve, a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which we'll see some pictures of. So these are the ones which we'll, which we'll go through next. So first up, the very important nerve, femoral nerve, main nerve that supplies the hip. So when we um, do a femoral nerve block, what are the areas we're looking to get numb? So in terms of the skin, most of the front of the leg uh, in the thigh area, down to the front of the leg, medial part in the leg area, down to the ankle. So in terms of the muscle, uh, it supplies um, most of the quadriceps, a um, little bit on the lateral side, tensor fascia lata. So those muscles will be numb, so the patient won't be able to um, lift their leg up straight without bending their knee. So the quadriceps will be numb. In terms of nerve supply to the bone, which is what we're interested in, because fracture pain, as you know, is because of periosteal disruption. So if you look at here, most of the front of the bone of the femur, especially the neck, will all be numb right down to the bottom, a little bit on the back. And in terms of the um, ileum, a little bit around the anterior, inferior iliac spine, Will be, will be numb as well. So predominantly the front of the neck of the femur, which is what you're interested in for hip fracture. So that's a good area to be numb if you want to provide relief. So this will be what's numb in a femoral nerve block. So how do we do a femoral nerve block with using ultrasound? So your probe is going to be positioned like that. So that line there would correspond to the inguinal ligament. So you want to go as high up towards the inguinal ligament in the femoral crease. The probe position is going to be parallel to the inguinal ligament. So uh, the reason for that is um, if if you want to get a good ultrasound picture, your ultrasound beam, which um, Dr. Kiran was saying, has is only one millimeter thick. So it has to be perfectly perpendicular to the object of interest if you want to get a good picture. So if you want to see a nice round picture like that, 
your probe needs to be nice and straight, cutting it through 90 degree angle so you don't lose or you don't have any of the artifacts um, which Dr. Kiran was saying about. So that's the probe position and um, different types of probes, um, as Dr. Kiran was saying. So in this one, we're using a high frequency linear probe because all superficial nerve blocks uh, can be done with a high frequency linear probe. And that gives you a better picture in terms of resolution. And your needle approach is going to come from lateral to medial in through the middle of the probe. So anatomically, um, this is a rough anatomical description. So what you aim to see is your femoral. So this is the medial side. This is the lateral side. You'll see the femoral artery. You'll see the femoral vein. And you'll see the femoral nerve lateral to the femoral artery underneath the fascia iliaca. This white line here is fascia iliaca. Your femoral nerve is underneath. It's in a separate compartment to the other one. So this line here is fascia lata. This line here is fascia iliaca. And underneath the fascial iliaca is your femoral nerve. Underneath the fascia lata is your blood vessels. And this big muscle here is iliacus. So, so ultrasound picture relates to the anatomical picture here. So you see a femoral artery, see a femoral vein, and you see the femoral nerve and fascia iliaca on top. So that's the orange line that represents the fascia iliaca. So you want to be underneath that layer. So And your needle is going to come from lateral to medial, like so in this picture. So you want to penetrate the fascia iliaca, but stay above the muscle and put some local anesthetic underneath. And that's your needle position with the nerve highlighted and your local should surround your needle. Uh, sorry, your local should surround your nerve uh, Above and below, if, you, if you're lucky, but as long as it's on one side to the side, it's okay. It's going to get numb. Don't You don't need to be tempted to go all the way through as long as it's somewhere in the vicinity of the nerve and not into the muscle. It'll work fine. So moving on, fascia iliaca block, um, one of the commonest blocks that hasn't been done for a while um, because it's easy to do landmark. So we'll look at it landmark first and then we'll go to the uh, ultrasound pictures. So fascia iliaca, I already mentioned a little bit in the previous slide. So it is a fascia layer that lies above the iliacus muscle and underneath that lies femoral nerve. And like I said, the vessels lie in a separate compartment. Um, this is medial, this is lateral. So the nerve we're trying to numb predominantly is the femoral nerve. But if we are lucky, we might get a little bit of that lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. But if you only re if you're really lucky now, I say if you're really lucky is because um, imagine you're putting local anesthetic here for it to go all the way up there is going to be a little bit tricky. But sometimes if you put your local here and try and sort of keep your hand distally, you might get the local pushed up and the locals pushing up towards the head end, you might get the lateral femoral cutaneous, uh, but you're unlikely to get the operator because it's too far away. So. With the fascia iliaca block, you'll predominantly get the femoral nerve and you might get the lateral cutaneous if you're lucky. And uh, this is a much more of a pictorial description um, of the same thing. So you've got femoral nerve, you've got the lateral femoral cutaneous. Now, if in this picture, if you see a little bit, um, uh, sort of, if you look at it cl clearly, the lateral femoral cutaneous is above the fascia iliaca. So that's why we say if you're lucky, you get some local anesthetic at the top and go in there. Otherwise, you're not going to get a very reliable um, lateral cutaneous nerve block with a fascia iliaca. Again, your operator nerves here are well away from where your fascia iliaca is. So if somebody says you're going to get a operator nerve block with a fascia iliaca block, um, they're kidding themselves because it's very, very unlikely. So landmark-wise, what do you do? So you basically draw a line from your pubic tubercle to your anterior superior iliac spine. So that's the mark for the anterior superior iliac spine. And then in that line, you divide into three groups and a junction of medial third and lateral third, you want to see, feel the femoral artery. Once you feel the femoral artery, you go centimeter lateral and then go pointing up towards the head. In this case, obviously, if you're doing landmark, you have to use a nerve stimulator so you can um, sometimes uh, hit the fem femoral nerve and get it. If not, what you do is you feel for two pops. First pop is fascia lata, this layer here. Second pop is fascia iliaca. And then once you got the second pop, you inject a decent volume. It's got to be 20 to 30 mils to fill the fascia so you can get some local going this way and going that way. 
So that's your landmark. So draw a line between these two, divide into three sections, feel for the femoral artery and go lateral. So feel for the femoral artery, go lateral. So this is landmark. Now these days, uh, I've just seen Dr. Abdullah, he um, shows an ultrasound mach machine in his hospital. So I'm assuming he won't have to do that and he can use the ultrasound quite comfortably. So with ultrasound, we've had a, a in new approach called the supra-inguinal approach. Uh, in the previous slide, I showed you infra-inguinal landmark approach because that's what you could do with a landmark. But with ultrasound, because you could see above the inguinal ligament, a supra-inguinal approach uh, has been um, sort of shown to work. And with the supra-inguinal approach, the advantage is you can push the local high up into um, in cephalad. So that way, you're likely to get lateral cutaneous more. So how do we do the supra-inguinal approach and what do we get if we do it? So in terms of numbness, uh, if you look at this picture, it numbs predominantly the femoral nerve area and some of the lateral cutaneous nerve area. So you've got two nerves. Muscle-wise, muscle effectively the same thing. Bone-wise, effectively the same area is going to be numb, predominantly femoral area. So the only addition with the supra-inguinal is you might get the lateral cutaneous. So otherwise, it's pretty much like a femoral nerve. So which way is the probe going to be? Again, we're using the same probe like a femoral nerve block, a high frequency linear probe. But if you look at it, the direction, because we want to be supra-inguinal, about the direction is cephalad to caudad. So your probe's pointing upwards. Previously, it was that way for the femoral nerve. This way, it's going to be pointing upwards to the umbilicus, and your needle is going to come from caudad to cephalad, so below upwards. So that's the direction of your needle travel. So what are we going to see in terms of the muscle? So this is a anatomical um, diagram um, of the supraanguinal block. So what you want to see is about three muscles, a bony shadow. So this bone is anterior inferior iliac spine. And then you see three muscles. The main muscle is the iliacus muscle. Um, so at the, at the top is internal oblique or abdominal muscles. And here would be uh, the sartorius muscle and you'll see the vessels um, femoral vessels over here so this is a pictorial representation we'll come to look at um, the ultrasound picture in a second now <clears throat> so this would be the same sonoanatomy of this landmark picture so underneath the white line is anterior inferior iliac spine so about this area here so if you look at it so your probe is going to be positioned this way and you're hitting the anterior inferior iliac spine about, about there, here. That's what you're looking to see. Um, so this is a white line and black underneath. So if you remember Dr. Kiran's talk, when ultrasound hits bone, there is nothing seen behind it because ultrasound doesn't travel past bone. So white line and black un underneath should be easy to see. And this chunky muscle on top is iliacus muscle. And these two muscles on either side, the one at the front, um, towards the head end is the internal oblique, towards the bottom end is sartorius, and you see the two vessels, femoral artery and vein. No, sorry, not femoral artery, it's a deep circumflex iliac artery and vein. So, um, so, so somebody wanted to just give a name to this um, uh, sort of technique, or, or at least the um, la um, muscles in this one. So they decided these two muscles on either side look like a bow tie. So they said, um, if you want to get to the correct landmark, identify that, find the bow tie sign. So if you look at it, it looks like a bow tie. So if you're in that, if you can see a bow tie, decent bow tie, then you, you know you're in the right location. So that line sort of that runs underneath the bow tie is our area of interest. That is the fascia iliaca. So the muscle underneath this iliacus muscle, that line above is fascia iliaca. So where do we need to be with our needle? We need to be underneath the iliaca, which makes sense because that's what fascia iliaca blockers. Um, and what do we do with that? So we want to put local underneath it. So your needle comes this way, penetrates it, and you want to run the local underneath the fascia iliaca above the iliacus muscle. So, sorry, go back. Uh, the wrong. So you want to be underneath the iliacus muscle uh, iliacus fascia and put some local anesthetic above the iliacus muscle. So if you do that, this is going to run. So your needle is going that way and you put your local, it's going to run towards the cephalad and then numb the nerves that come from the um, lumbar plexus. So that's the idea. Again, the main nerve is going to be femoral nerve, but you might get some 
So this is fairly easy to do and you've got less um, harm of the nerves because you're going underneath the fascia in the muscle. There's no nerves to harm as long as you're careful with this vessel. So that's supraingual fascia iliac block. So we'll move to um, infraingual. Uh, I'll show you in a minute. But next bit is uh, peng block, which is the pericapsular nerve group block. Um, so what are we doing with this one? So this one, predominantly, we're blocking the front capsule of the hip. So front capsule, we discussed three nerves, femoral, obturator, and accessory. So that's what we're trying to block. So when we do this block, what is going to be numb? The only bit that's going to be numb is a capsular area and the periosteum. You won't get any sensory block. You won't get any neuromuscular block because what you're doing to do is just numb the articular branches of the femoral obturator and accessory obturator. This is quite good because that's what we want in a hip fracture. We want to keep the um, neck of uh, femur pain-free as much as possible. So what are we going to do in terms of approach? Your approach is going to be fairly similar to um, how we did our femoral nerve block, but slightly higher. But if you look at it, this is a different probe. We're using a low-frequency probe because we need to look slightly deeper. And what we're looking for is uh, a tendinous structure. So we're not looking at a nerve because the articular branch is too small to see. So a bigger probe, because the object of interest is going to be deeper, would help. And the approach is going to come from lateral to medial. Um, so, and what are we hoping to see? We're hoping to see a solid white line like this to start with, which would be this line here. So your probe is going to sort of come along, sit along this line, and you're going to see a solid white line here. And then you're going to slide down a little bit to see this structure. And that structure, where that white line points to, is your psoas tendon. And your local anesthetic is going to go between the white line, which is the um, iliopubic eminence. or This is the anterior inferior iliac spine, and then there's the iliopubic eminence. So between these two here will lie the psoas tendon, and you deliberately go hit the bone, and you want to put local anesthetic underneath to lift the psoas tendon. The reason to do that is your hip capsule is just below here, so when you hit the bone and put some local anesthetic, it's going to spread all over the hip capsule. And you use a psoas tendon as a landmark because that's the one that's easy to see. What's more important here is these structures. So your aim is to shine like that. Your needle is going to hit the bone, put some local anesthetic tendon. So what's more important, you have to be mindful of the femoral nerve, femoral vein, and femoral artery. Those are the structures that are here. In this picture, they're here. Femoral artery, femoral vein, and femoral nerve. You're fairly lateral to it, but just be mindful in case you're coming fairly this way, don't hit the femoral nerve, especially if it's a patient who's doing it under general anesthetic. So your aim is to hit the bone, lift the psoas tendon, flood the area with local, and that's going to seep and numb this part of the hip. So it's fairly easy to do. And again, um, because bone is easy to see on ultrasound, you should be able to locate, you should be able to get this picture fairly easily, even in a uh, slightly obese patient. So that is pericapsular nerve group block that numbs the anterior capsule of the hip. So lumbar plexus block. Um, this has been done for many years landmark-wise. So we in this one, we'll look at specifically the ultrasound approach. So lumbar plexus, as you know, um, femoral nerve comes from the lumbar plexus. So when you do a lumbar plexus block, you can get a femoral nerve um, maybe a little bit of lateral cutaneous, but predominantly femoral nerve. Um, so this picture is pretty much the same which we saw in femoral nerve block. So the areas that needs to be numb will be numb in terms of femoral nerve. In terms of probe position, again, we're using a high frequency probe because it's a bigger probe that gives us more view of deeper structures. Um, and again, we are going to be seeing predominantly bone and muscle in this. So this probe will suffer this. It doesn't need to be high resolution. And your needle is going to come from lat sort of posterior to anterior. So what are we going to look in this picture? So we're going to look for some bone shadows and some muscle shadows. So in terms of labeling, so you want to see this finger pointing structure. So you're sort of pointing your probe at a lumbar vertebra. This is one half of the lumbar vertebra. So the patient's lying on the side. So this is the anterior part this is a posterior part so you're seeing the vertebral body and that 
pointy bit that comes across is called the transverse process. And then you've got a spinous process going behind. And you see three muscles along it. So in this picture, if you see the muscle in the front is psoas, this one is quadratus lumborum, and this muscle, big muscle combination muscle is erector spinae. Now, somebody again wanted to name this block um, view, uh, rather. Uh, so they named, it's called a shamrock view. And if you have, if you've not seen a shamrock, it's a three clover leaf, um, sort of common in Ireland. So uh, this is called a shamrock view, and that's how it's spelled. So you want to basically see the three muscles, but the main muscle you're interested in is the psoas muscle. Why are we interested in the psoas muscle? Because our lumbar plexus is situated within the muscle belly of the psoas muscle. So that's why you want to see a psoas muscle. Now, there are important structures in the front here. The peritoneum is closed and you've got the abdominal contents and sometimes the abdominal aorta. So lumbar plexus situated the posterior part of the psoas, so your needle shouldn't go any further. So our area of interest with the needle is going to be posterior part of the psoas. So your needle is going to come from the back, like so here, and it's coming from the back here, and it aims to stick to the posterior part of the psoas muscle. Now, you don't necessarily see the nerves as clearly as in this picture. So you have to use a nerve stimulator, and when you use the nerve stimulator, you will get twitches of the quadriceps, i.e. you are twitching the femoral components of the lumbar plexus. So if you get good twitches of the femoral nerve, then you know you're in the right area. And again, you need a decent volume because you're going to have to sort of fill that muscle with local anesthetic. So it'll probably take about 15 mils, 20 mils even to help it spread and numb the lumbar plexus. So this is probably slightly tricky to do in big patients because remember, if you've got a big fat pad in here, it's difficult to see and you may not get the view. So I wouldn't choose this as a first choice block for a hip fracture, but if you've got no other options, but this is the only option you can, then you can use it. And it is effective because at the end of the day, you're numbing the femoral nerve. So femoral nerve block in the form of lumbar plexus. So uh, fascia iliaca infrainguinal, uh, let's just run through this quickly. Um, in essence, it is no different doing a femoral nerve block. Your probe position, your technique, everything is similar to a femoral nerve block. The only difference I would say is probably you're going a little bit, um, maybe towards the head, sort of close to inguinal ligament. So you might see this muscle here, which is the sartorius. And then what you want to do is penetrate the uh, fascia iliaca and then put some local anesthetic to run surrounding the femoral nerve. And because you're slightly higher than a femoral nerve, you might get a little bit of spread. But infrainguinal fascia iliaca is as good as a femoral nerve block. So if you if you can see the femoral nerve, just do that instead of this. Um, so ne next bit we're going to do is the um, obturator nerve block. Um, so this would um, numb just one part um, of the of obturator, um, sorry, one part supply of the um, hip joint. Um, so you, you, if you want to provide numbness to um, the medial part of the hip, so if you, skin-wise, this part is going to be numb, muscle-wise, this part is going to be numb, and in terms of the bone, only the inside part of the neck of the femur. So obturator nerve on its own is not going to help um, if you, you have to do a femoral nerve block along with the obturator nerve block. So uh, how do we do this? We use a um, high-frequency probe where you basically looking up into the groin, and especially in a big patient, it can be a little bit tricky, and your positions are going to be very medial because your obturator nerve is fairly medial, and anatomically, uh, you're going to see um, muscles, about three, mus four muscles, I would say. The main muscle you want to see is this one, pectineus, and then the three adductor group of muscles. Uh, and your obturator nerve is, lies underneath. So this is what's called a subpectineal approach. So what you want to see is this big muscle. The ultrasound picture will show you that. So um, your probe's medial, and you're aiming to see these four muscles. The big muscle is pectineus. The muscle underneath is adductor um, magnus, this muscle is adductor brevis, and um, adductor longus. So your obturator nerve lies underneath the pectineus above the magnus. So you've got the two nerves, anterior division and posterior division. So if you can see these four muscles and your needle uh, is going to come from, again, lateral to medial, 
going through the pectineus and then underneath the pectineus is where you put your loculum. So this one's going to give you some numbness in your inside of your femur and a little bit on the skin. But this alone won't be enough. And technically, if somebody has got a hip fracture, you put your probe in and you're trying to do it, it can be very uncomfortable. So this is something you can use to supplement if they have a general anesthetic of post-op analgesia, but I wouldn't use this for pre-op analgesia. Uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is the... Um, other nerve uh, we'll look at in terms of ultrasound. Again, this is predominantly acute, well, not predominantly, it is a cutaneous nerve. So this is not going to provide you analgesia for hip fracture, but this will help with uh, analgesia postoperatively and intraoperatively. So with this one, you're numbing the area of the skin incision on the lateral side. So our proposition is going to be very similar to femoral nerve, but slightly lateral because it obviously the nerve is lateral to the femoral nerve. And you're going to look for, again, uh, two muscles and a gap in between them. Uh, the two the muscles you're looking are sartorius. And then um, that's the main muscle you're looking at. Lateral to the sartorius is the tensor fascia lata. So this is quad biceps muscle underneath. So your uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is in a small tunnel. This is fat-filled tunnel between the sartorius muscle and tensor fascia lata. And it's very superficial. So if you look at the markings here, it's only about half a centimeter from the skin. So you're literally, literally subcutaneous effectively. So if you see, if you put your probe in there, slide laterally, and if you see the sartorius and tensor fascia with a gap in between, and you see a little nerve in there, you get your needle in there to put your local anesthetic. You only need about two, three mils at the most to fill that tunnel, and then that will numb it. And that will provide you cutaneous analgesia, anesthesia, for your surgical incision intra and postoperatively. So block technique, um, most of the nerve blocks for lower limbs, we tend to use a 22 gauge nerve block needle, uh, a five centimeter, 50 millimeter or an 80 millimeter needle will suffice, predominantly 50. And local anesthetic, you can use whichever local anesthetic you have access to. Uh, obviously, if you use um, a short acting one, the duration will be less. And if you use a long acting one, it's gonna be prolonged. Uh, you obviously calculate the dose based on weight um, and then you stay within that in terms of volume um, it's sort of a range from 10 to 30 mils if you're doing a femoral nerve block 10 mils is more than enough uh, if you're doing a fascial plane block like a fascia iliaca or a lumbar plexus then uh, obviously you need to use a higher volumes so about 30 mils uh, so which one would you choose and what are the uh, sort of differences in each um, so quick comparison so we've just talk about the three main ones we normally do, femoral, fascia iliaca, and pang block. Uh, all of them are efficacious, like I said, because all of them numb the um, anterior capsule. Um, in terms of local anesthetic toxicity, obviously wherever you use a lower volume, in this case, femoral would be less, and the other two um, will be higher volume. Uh, muscle weakness, uh, if you block the femoral nerve consistently, then you're going to um, get muscle weakness. With the peng block, because you don't target the nerve, you just target the capsule, your muscle weakness will be low, which is quite important if you think about a hip fracture patient, because you want them to mobilize after. You don't want them to leave with muscle weakness and they can't mobilize. So pain relief is good, but at the same time, you need to mobilize as well. And uh, other one, common worries about nerve blocks of vascular injury, um, are slightly high in femoral nerve block because you have the femoral vessels, nerve injury, pretty much higher in femoral nerve block. Cutaneous coverage um, with a femoral one, uh, more or less pretty much um, same for the femoral and fascia iliaca. With PENG, there is no cutaneous coverage because like I said, you're only blocking the articular branches. So um, overall, uh, I would say between the three, uh, if you want to give a decent block, you either choose a femoral nerve or um, if you want to choose a preoperative analgesic block, choose a femoral block or a fascia iliaca. For intraoperative analgesic adjunct, use a PENG block. That's probably what how I would go. So why do we need to do nerve blocks? We've, we've said, obviously, it's a disease with high morbidity, but it is not just about pain relief. If you look at the population that has hip fractures, um, if you give them plenty of opioids, they're going to be confused, they're going to be delirious, uh, they're going to um, basically not be able to mobilize after. Uh, Opioids obviously decrease the respiratory rate, so you're going to increase respiratory complications. And also nerve blocks are going to help you assist in positioning for neuroaxial anesthesia for the operation. Uh, they're going to be comfortable. You don't, don't need to use much sedatives if you put a nerve block in to position them, which can only be helpful in an older population. And like I said, earlier mobilization hospital discharge is key in these groups. Otherwise, 
the mortality as it is at eight percent, it's going to be more than that if you if you can't get them out of hospital. Um, so based on this, um, like and the UK, um, um, Nice and the hip fracture database, um group the audit program the fragility audit program came up with some key performance indicators so and um, they basically said time frame say uh, one of the time frames was as soon as the patient arrives uh, you give them analgesia and then you try and get them operated on within 36 hours and then then mobilize them and get them out of hospital uh, so when they initially designed it um, they were focused predominantly on operating on them so pretty much they were setting targets to say well operate on them within 37 36 hours then they realized there were many delays for operations so they said well at least we can give them pain relief so then they um, added a another key performance indicator of zero so these are one two three but then they thought zero would be the starting point and that zero was pain relief and that's where our nerve blocks come in so that started from 2022 and uh, so like I said, you can access UK database from anywhere. And this is my hospital database. This is Royal Preston Hospital here. Um, so uh, so this graph basically shows the anesthetic component of it. So um, if I say people, uh, these are people who had hip fracture surgery done uh, in from August 2012 up until October 2023. So this is the number of people. So if you look at it, um, so this let's say this green line, green line is... Um, spinal anesthetic. So in 2012, predominantly, they all had general anesthetics. And from about, I, I told you about 20, 2011, the NICE guidelines came and 2014, our anesthetic audit about um, what type of analgesia, anesthesia, did, and then more awareness about giving spinal anesthetic started. So from 2015, it took off big time. And then there was a fall in 2018, 2019, for some reason. And then since then, um, it's there is some uptake but predominantly it stayed as a plateau uh in terms of a spinal uh, anesthetic uh, sorry um sorry excuse me this is not just spinal this is spinals with no blocks so the no blocks took off and then after that um about here in 2018 there was emphasis um of um uh, no blocks being affecting mobility so people started using less no blocks intraoperatively so predominantly spinal so this blue line is spinal for operation. So what we're looking at is mainly in this topic is uh, nerve blocks for the hip. So this graph here just shows nerve blocks done for hip. So this dotted line is the national average. How many people had nerve blocks? This up and down line is my hospital average. So um, that up and down is because depends on who is in the emergency department and who does block. So it goes up and down, but it sort of stays around the same line. But actually, increasingly, there's more no blocks done. So from compared to 2017 to 2023, there is more no blocks done. So at the moment, 60% of all our patients are getting no blocks. So which is good. Uh, it was 50 uh, odd percent for 10 years ago. It's coming up to 60%. So that is good. Um, so why do we do it for a clinician? Obviously, you're providing a patient good relief. Uh, you sort of are doing it away from the operating theater. In your case, it's mostly uh, A&E people doing it preoperatively. In theater, we do it. And increasingly, it's becoming, um, funding-wise, it's becoming difficult, but we can do no blocks needing not so much money. And I'll just finish off uh, with this slide. Um, so this is a concept of marginal gains. I don't know if any of you heard. So this came from uh, British Cycling. Um, Tour de France, some of you might be aware, is a big cycling event. And um, British uh, the Sky Team, which is a predominantly British cyclists, um, use this concept of marginal gains. What it means is, even if it's just a small improvement, 1%, if you do it consistently over a period of time, you'll eventually see uh, a benefit. So if you think, oh, it's only just one nerve block, how is that going to improve? But if you carry on doing it over a period of time, like I just showed in that previous graph, over 10 years, our um, um, no block rates increase. So we've just small improvements. If you leave, don't do that small improvements, you will see a decline. So every little helps. So even though it's a small technique, even though it's a small part of the management, uh, please encourage everybody to do a no blocks for hip fracture. It helps. So on that note, um, I shall say thank you for all of you. Uh, and Mahad um, Sanid, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Torvel, Mahasenit. <laughs> uh, we hope 
that today webinar has provided with a valuable insights and also a valuable knowledge. Thank you for your commitment and also we're gonna thank you and also the other colleagues from the from the hospital also. Uh, it's time for questions. So uh, I think that we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so um, it's, I'll um, I'll answer the one that's there. So somebody's asked, uh, can we do no block catheters and blocks in anticoagulated patients like on warfarins and direct anticoagulants? Um, this is a common scenario we encounter. Um, so a simple answer depends on where your nerve block is. So if it is a superficial nerve block, like a femoral nerve block, uh, yes, uh, you can do nerve blocks as long as you visualize the artery and vein properly. I would say uh, I'll do only single shot nerve blocks. I wouldn't put catheters in people on anticoag anticoagulation because... Um, catheters are likely to cause slightly more trauma and obviously they stay in and if they have a bleeding problem afterwards um, it'd be difficult to manage uh, yes so you can do single shot superficial nerve blocks like a femoral nerve block but i wouldn't do a deeper nerve block like um, a lumbar plexus block for that matter um, because there if it bleeds you have no way to control the bleeding so i would do a fascia iliaca block and a femoral knock quite uh, comfortably um, in anticoagulants, but not a lumbar plexus. Hope that answers your questions. Um, next in the same one was, can we do spinals for patients having aspirin and clopidogrel? Um, uh, we do spinals for pa patients who are on aspirin, but we don't do spinals for people on clopidogrel if they've not stopped it one, uh, at least seven days because it's a bit more risky. So we would say um, if they're on clopidogrel and if they're not stopped it for seven days, don't do spinals. But aspirin, it can it can do it. It's not a big problem. Um, third question is, if you have very high-risk surg patient, can we go for conservative non-surgery approach? Um, I don't know what they mean by that. It's probably a surgical decision as to how they're going to manage um, the hip fracture um, because our part is pro the anesthetic analgesic part. So I'm not quite sure um, it'll be an appropriate thing for me to answer that question because it's a surgical question. So the last one on that is for a patient having cemented hemiarthroplasty, can we ask surgeons to avoid cement? Um, again, it's a surgical question, so I don't know um, why. I don't know what they mean by that question. So maybe they can ask it again or maybe you can explain. So I've seen a couple of questions in the yeah. chat box, so I've yeah. already replied to them. Uh, we can use ultrasound and nerve stimulation in locating nerves. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can use, and um, there are certain nerves, uh, sorry, certain needles, which give that capability of um, having echogenicity and also um, having the provision of nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not um, unwise for many starters to build your confidence to use scanning and uh, you know and getting more proficient as you move up the ladder to uh, start as a, a you know a, as a starter but once you re reasonably get used to you don't need to use nerve stimulator on a regular basis and occasionally you might come across certain anatomical anomalies where you might not be able to uh, really comprehend the anatomy wisely then you can use uh, you know uh, in those scenarios uh, with the combination Next question are portable handheld ultrasound machines like Butterfly having robust and sustainable performance. Um, obviously, you can look from the price itself. Why would they pay, price them uh, you know, so low if they have the, all the abilities? They're usually, um, they're, I don't think they're a replacement for the standard ultrasound machines uh, with so many other capabilities. But having said that, uh, it's better to have uh, something rather than not having anything. So... Uh, handheld machines we do use, of course, for uh, superficial nerve blocks, uh, especially in uh, outpatient yeah. settings I use in my um, uh, pain clinics. And also for plain blocks, they're reasonably good. But, uh, you know, going closer to uh, bigger vital structures, be a little bit more wary of it, especially for uh, uh, doing endoscalines or um, uh, close to the lung, etc. Um, coming to the questions in uh, Q&A. Um, 
Uh, I think uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, from Astra is um, looking to uh, the YouTube availability is always there. You can always go back and uh, see the slides. And he's also possibly going to add uh, the slides from today's uh, evening presentations to the e-learning module on the Astra website. So it will be a good asset for those who want to see them. Um, I think that's uh, 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 there's a question fine. there's a question for the q and answer section uh, yeah, do you have any recommendation of best brand after some machine in terms of being cost and clearance a friend from Egypt raised that question yeah, okay. what is that? I think it's a bit uh, you know commercial again I'm I'm not sure I mean Depends, depending on the availability of machines in your uh, workplace or possibly uh, if you're shopping around, uh, uh, some of the equipment might be available in the country as well. Um, so, and you'll have to see what is best for you. Uh, I mean, obviously there are machines ranging anywhere between uh, thousand pounds to about uh, 50,000 pounds. And um, there's no guarantee that uh, yeah, the 50,000 pounds will definitely will give you a better image. But at the same time, go, going back to the similar question that you face when you go to medical school, which stethoscope to get? It doesn't matter which stethoscope. <laughs> it is the one that is, in, that is between the two years that is more important. So how you can relate your anatomy and, you know, a realistic anatomy knowledge into sono anatomy and also putting it into practice is also going to pay, play an important role. But at the same time, yeah, yes, of course, you need a reasonable amount of gadget, but uh, you know, you'll have to decide which one it is. And I cannot uh, uh, say anything because of commercial reasons. Uh, Dr. Well, there's a question for you in the QA box. Um, um, a friend asked us, um, is the pop plan like FIB technique can cover the obturator nerve? Sorry, say that again. I didn't get that question. Uh, is the pop plan like FIB technique, fascia elect block, can cover the obturator nerve? Um, what what can what can cover? Um, you would think you sort of he he uh yeah the friend right is yeah. the pop landmark pop landmark so i don't understand oh, the pop also. pop or pop landmark um no yeah. it 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 won't like i said the uh, obturator nerve is well away from um so it has to cover different muscle layers so if you look at uh, if you remember my earlier picture so you've got the iliacus muscle and then you've got the pectineus muscle and underneath um, pectineus muscle is where the obturator nerve lives so even if you try and push your local anesthetic by placing a hand distally and it still won't get you you, you could use 20 30 mils previously people thought um, it it might work but uh, i think there's been plenty of studies cadaver studies to say it doesn't really reach the obturator uh, nerve. so answer is no uh, there's a question that uh, that follows the same question so one friend asked you uh, any tip about the, he struggles about supreme going on FIP. So can you give him some? So tips? um, so what with the supreme going on? Yeah, it's it's a good question. It when you start initially, uh, it is so. What you do to get to the supraingual is you place your probe uh, on the anterior superior iliac spine to start with because that's easy to see. It's a big landmark. Even in obese patients, you should still be able to feel. And like I said, with the probe, you so your probe needs to be sort of um, pointing cephalad to caudad. Um, you, it needs to point like towards the umbilicus. So uh, slightly oblique towards the umbilicus and then find the anterior superior iliac spine. And then you slide your probe medially towards the groin, down and medially. And then next little bump what you'll see is the uh, anterior inferior iliac spine let me see if i can can i just put the my picture up just uh, probably easier to describe with my picture is that okay 
Absolutely. Uh, yeah, just give me one second. Um, so let me just share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes, of course. Yeah. Can see. Okay. So um, if what we do is so that's your proposition. Okay. So you're going to start off. This is the anterior inferior iliac spine. So what you want to do is you start off with your proposition on the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay. And then you slide the probe till you get to see the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is this shadow here. Okay. So start here which will be easier to see. And then you slide your probe. You keep your probe in that angulation, but slide, slide your probe. Um, and then till you see the next little bump, next small bump, that small bump will be the anterior inferior iliac spine. Now, if you see that with the probe like that, then you should be able to see the muscle, iliacus muscle, like so. And then you should be able to see the white line and then the vessels. Then obviously you should get your needle underneath the deep circumflex iliac. So you start off by starting there, anterior superior iliac spine, and then with the probe orientation, that way your probe needs to move medially till you see the anterior inferior iliac spine, and then you should be able to locate it. it comes with practice. Um, so initially it's um, it can feel a little bit tricky, but because you're trying to see bone, you can identify it pretty easily. I hope that explains your uh, question. Thank you so much. Uh, so the other friend asks us, is the sciatic block important to do for hip analgesia? And um, can bring block and sciatic and obturate and give us a weak surgery? Um, awake, like I said, awake surgery for hip is um, very difficult because it's quite complex innovation. So if you want to do awake, um, I think spinal or regional anesthesia, central, central neuraxial is the way to do it. Uh, otherwise, it'll be quite tricky. Remember, with hip surgery, it's not just about analgesia. A hip is surrounded by um, lots of strong muscles. Yeah, your gluteuses, your tensor fascia lata, your quadriceps. So them muscles need to be relaxed for the surgeon to be able to get into it. And you can't really relax those muscles just with doing uh, different nerve blocks you need to be higher. So it's got to be either a neuraxial anesthesia or general anesthesia. Um, I suspect the only procedure you can really do just with a bit of ketamine and um, nerve block is a dynamic hip screw. Yeah, because that's fairly lower down. But if there's anything like a hemiarthroplasty or a hip arthro total hip arthroplasty, uh, I don't think you can just do it just under a nerve block. So even if you do a sciatic, it still won't be completely enough. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my friend asks us uh, about the difference between, or you need explanation about anatomical landmark basic regional block or and basic ultrasound guided regional block. Um, I don't, so, so what's okay. what's the question? What difference in what way? Yeah, I think he needs difference between an um, anatomical landmark basic regional blocks or and basic ultrasound re guided regional blocks. So some um, blocks maybe I, I I think he mean uh, some blocks you will see the nerve issues. Some places you will um, you can't see the nerves. You will target the the anatomy or the landmark something. Yeah. yeah, obviously the superficial, the super, um, just to answer your question uh, pretty generically, uh, if the nerve is reasonably superficial, or if it's a big nerve, you will be able to see it with ultrasound. Uh, but if it's a partial plane block, for that matter, obviously you can't really see the nerve or for a peng block, because they are very small nerves and articular branches. So you basically go for the anatomical location. Um, so there are some differences and ultrasound, um, I don't know how prevalent it is where you work, but increasingly it's 
used across all areas for us, vascular access and everything. So it does come with practice. There is a little bit of a learning curve, but once you start using it, uh, it does get easier and it becomes easy. So hence, um, as I was saying earlier, the regional anesthesia circles, they've designed um, what's called a plan A block, which are basic blocks everybody should be able to do uh, using ultrasound. So that's about femoral nerve block, cytic block for the lower limb, and then you've got um, interscalene, axillary, um, and supraclavicular blocks for the upper limb. So at least five or six basic blocks you should be able to do with ultrasound, and it is easy. So once you start there, after that, it does get easier. Yeah, like, I think last question. Uh, one friend asked us, um, which block is sufficient for femoral neck fracture surgery? as a stand-alone block? Or um, is it recommended to do two blocks for sufficient coverage? And depends what type of surgery it is. Like I said, if it's a hemiarthroplasty, um, one or two blocks won't be enough um, for anesthesia. Analgesia, then if it's if you're talking about analgesia, then if you do a femoral nerve block or if you do a fascia iliaca block, that'll be good. But if you're talking about anesthesia, uh, then any number of blocks will won't be completely enough you have to do a spinal but if you're going to want if you're going to give them a general anesthetic and if you're talking about just analgesia for hip fractures then yeah do a fascia iliaca block or a peng block or any of the, any of the ones i've talked about uh, thank you so much uh, i think this question is uh, uh, very important one friend asked us uh, when i do the bank block i feel a lot of resistance is that normal very normal. Good question. Um, because um, that area, you've got the bone, you've got the periosteum, and you've got the psoas tendon. So sometimes if you feel a lot of resistance, you're probably catching a little bit of the psoas tendon, or you pro you're probably uh, in trying to inject into the periosteum. So what we would suggest is uh, when you hit the bone, uh, withdraw your needle maybe half a centimeter, a little bit, and then try and put a bit of local in, and that res resistance should get better. Um, so it is fairly normal to initially feel resistance. So withdraw a needle half a centimeter and then try and inject and see if you can lift the tendon. Uh, thank you so much. I hope that's all for tonight. Uh, so uh, thank you for your insightful lesson. And also it will be a great night tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Abdullahi, for the opportunity and also Afsra for the opportunity. Um, wish everyone a good night. Yep. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Abdullahi, Mo and uh, Kiran and uh, Afsra as well. Thank you. Thank you, Afsra team. And also, I'm wishing I will see you in person. Yep. In somewhere. In the world. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Okay. Good night.